on the air with more mixed messages about the economy with a jobs report that's actually pretty strong, but with the prices you pay still high. You've got President Biden coming out telling all of us there are reasons to be confident. So coming up, we're going to take a look at what those reasons are, even as the world's richest man says he's got a super bad feeling about the economy. Plus, a top Trump advisor is in court today after getting indicted for contempt of Congress. How Peter Navarro is now defending himself inside that courtroom and what the January 6th committee really wants to know from him. And not even 24 hours after NBC News exclusively learned about new moves by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis targeting trans kids in that state. He's now going after the Tampa Bay Rays because the team's speaking out about gun violence. Why we could be seeing Disney and Don't Say Gay 2.0. We'll talk about that. Plus, on this National Gun Violence Day, we're getting a behind-the-scenes look at an active shooter training at a middle school in Dallas. Why students say it makes them feel safer in the backstory. Plus, Ukraine's soccer team needs a few more goals to reach their ultimate goal, getting to this fall's FIFA World Cup. Only one team stands in their way now. An incredible Cinderella story. We've got their chances in Sunday's match later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and here's the challenge right now for President Biden, right? How do you try to tackle two huge crises in this country when you can't do it alone? Because tonight, he's making this plea to Congress to address both gun violence and inflation on the economy. Well, at the same time, trying to reassure Americans, things really are looking up under his administration, specifically on the economic picture. After this stronger than expected jobs report for May, you see it on your screen right there. Three hundred ninety thousand jobs added this past month. That's a better number than what experts had predicted. You've got unemployment holding steady at three point six percent and hourly earnings up just a little bit. The thing about that, as I'm sure you probably know, is that what people are earning does not match what people are paying at the store. Next week, we're going to get the data giving us a better picture of whether or not stuff like eggs, milk, beef is getting more expensive last month. We already know inflation's at 40 year highs. But for now, we can use our daily marker of rising costs. You feel it when you go to fill up your car, gas prices. Right now, $4.76. That's the national average, up 15 cents from last week. And on top of that, you've now got the world's richest guy, Elon Musk, saying he has a super bad feeling about the economy as his company's stock drops again as did a lot of tech stocks, with the Nasdaq down some 2.5%. Even so, you've got President Biden trying to reassure Americans that he gets it. But overall, he says, there really is reason to feel confident in the economy. Watch. There's no denying that high prices, particularly around gasoline and food, are a real problem for people. But there's every reason for the American people to feel confident that we'll meet these challenges. Josh Letterman is traveling with the president in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Okay, Josh, so, so the... The R word, recession, is still the shadow over all of this. But the chief economist at yeah. Moody's, which is obviously a, something the White House likes to cite, says recession is not inevitable right now. And it's also not the most likely path for the economy. That's right, Hallie. And White House officials agree with that. They feel like there's not uh, an inevitability of a recession for two main reasons. One, because of the job side of the ledger, the fact that we have this historic uh, demand for workers that they feel uh, is a sign of underlying strength of the economy. Uh, the other reason, according to Brian Deese, the director of the National Economic Council, is that White House officials are continuing to hear directly from the heads of major U.S. businesses that demand for their product is through the roof. And so they don't feel like there's an inevitability of a recession. But that having been said, you know, it's not a huge surprise that the White House would choose to see the glass half full. And frankly, you know, it, it really depends on how well you trust their ability to predict uh, the future economically on a week when we both had the Treasury Secretary acknowledge that she was wrong about not seeing inflation coming. And pretty profound new questions have been raised about why this White House didn't see the, the baby formula uh, crisis coming. We know that the president is not has committed to not getting involved with whatever the Fed does. Right. But they're still planning to raise interest rates a little bit this month and next month. Are you hearing anything from the folks you're talking to at the White House, given that the economy is such a focus for them this month in particular on how they're getting ready for that? Yeah, well, they're getting ready for it by trying to get ahead of it politically and with the American public, Hallie. Uh, so you heard President Biden just this morning in his jobs remark saying, look, as we start to ease uh, back the gas pedal on the economy and the feds take these steps to curb inflation, including those interest rates, we may not see these blockbuster job growth months month after month. It may uh, be a little bit slower, and that's OK uh, because it is an effort to bring in uh, inflation. Uh, but the White House also very aware 
of the fact that as Americans start to see that in the five months left before the election, uh, that could add to the sense of economic malaise. And so they're trying uh, to sort of get out ahead of it as much as possible. I also want to talk about this back and forth. I don't know if you would call it a back and forth with Elon Musk and the president, but like, well, let me explain. You've got Musk, who obviously the CEO of Tesla, he's looking to buy Twitter, the world's richest guy. He says he's got a, again, I'm quoting him, super bad feeling about the economy. He wants to t cut 10 percent of jobs at Tesla, right? His stock is down 41 percent since the start of the year. The president was asked about it today, and he, um, he said other companies are adding jobs. And then he made this little quip. Listen. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of luck on his trip to the moon. I mean, I, I don't, I mean... Okay. So setting space aside, you know, you have what Musk says, you have what Jamie Dimon says, the J.P. Morgan Chase CEO, who says there might be an economic hurricane coming. Help us understand the dis what seems like a disconnect between the messaging out of the administration and the messaging from some of these business leaders. Yeah, I think that's really the question that the White House is struggling uh, to answer right now. O obviously, they want to put their best foot forward. They want to make the case to the American public that things are uh, are strong in the economy. But it's really hard to convince people uh, that things are better than they intrinsically feel that they are. And so when you have these heads of major companies uh, like Elon Musk coming out and saying they don't feel like the economy is so hot either, you know, uh, this is one of those cases where a perception is reality, right? If people don't feel like the economy is going Going well, that in and of itself becomes a drag on the economy, and that's something that White House economic officials are very worried about right now. Josh Letterman, good to see you. Thank you very much for that update. Right before we came on the air, former Trump advisor Peter Navarro was leaving federal court in Washington after being indicted by the Department of Justice on contempt of Congress charges. This was just happening as we were coming to set, and he's talking with reporters outside the courthouse. Keep in mind, he didn't turn himself in. So here's Navarro talking about how this whole thing went down. Watch. Instead of calling me and say, hey, we need you down at court, we've got a warrant for you, I would have gladly come. What did they do? They intercepted me getting on the plane. And then they put me in handcuffs, they bring me here, they put me in leg irons, they stick me in a cell. What they did to me today violated the Constitution. All right, so why is Navarro getting indicted in the first place? Remember, he refused to comply with the subpoena back in February from the January 6th Select Committee, the folks looking into the insurrection. The full House voted to recommend contempt charges to the DOJ in April. So basically, Congress put the ball in the Department of Justice's court. And the Department of Justice today acted on that fall, now charging Navarro with two counts of contempt of Congress, one for not providing papers, the other for not providing testimony to the committee. NBC News has also reached out to the Select Committee for comment. I want to bring in Pete Williams now. Um, uh, Pete Navarro is now the second of the four Trump allies who've been held in contempt to be indicted by the DOJ. Take us through what happened today, what Navarro could be looking at in terms of time spent behind bars, and then this important piece of context, even if he is convicted, he still doesn't have to testify. It doesn't force him to testify in front of the committee. Well, that's right. I'll start with the last point first. This charge is a punishment, a potential punishment for declining to cooperate with the committee. But a person convicted of this charge is not compelled then to cooperate. They're just punished for not cooperating. So the committee doesn't get anything out of this uh, unless the leverage of this potential prosecution causes him to change his mind. But it doesn't sound like he's going to do that. Uh, you're right about the nature of the charges here for refusing to show up or provide documents. Now, he said in emails to the committee that he, his hands were tied because President Trump had asserted executive privilege. He basically said, if you want this stuff, go talk to the president. I think one problem he has here is that he sent that email six days after the Supreme Court rejected President Trump's appeal of the case that was brought over the documents that were held by the National Archives that the committee wanted. Remember, Mr. Trump lost at every stage in those proceedings. The Supreme Court declined to block it. Federal Appeals Court did. The District Court did. They said, yeah, you may have some residual executive privileges of a former president, but it's not enough to overcome the Congress's need for these documents. So if he's, if he's saying, I had no choice, I couldn't cooperate because of executive privilege, that's one problem. Right. The second thing is he's got a civil lawsuit that he just filed against the committee saying, again, a, a familiar charge that's been leveled against this committee by a lot of people trying to block committee subpoenas or search warrants or whatever, saying this committee isn't properly constituted. It didn't follow the rules of the House. It doesn't have the authority to do this. Uh, you know, that, that argument also has gotten nowhere in the federal courts 
since that was first tried. So he sort of got a couple of strikes against him. Now, one other thing here, Hallie, he said to the judge today, I don't want this criminal case to go forward. I want you to put it on ice until my civil lawsuit is resolved on my attacking the committee in the first place. Um, you know, that I'm not sure is going to fly. What the judge may well say is, well, if you've got arguments, make them in your criminal case. Mm. Normally speaking, it's civil cases that have to wait while criminal cases are resolved. So he's got a, he's got a tall legal order here, and he's decided to represent himself. To the point that you're making here about the legal argument that the former trade advisor to former President Trump is making, um, I want to play a little clip because he was out on TV as recently as yesterday, right, less than 24 hours ago, laying out what felt a little bit like a preemptive defense here. Watch. The average lifespan in America for an American male is 76 years old. Um, if I were to go to prison for a year, which is what the contempt of charge could do to me, that would be about a fourth of my remaining life, and there would be a fine that would take a significant portion of re my retirement savings. So I'm taking this very seriously. Okay, so he's talking about how he's taking it seriously, but it does seem like perhaps he has an uphill legal battle here, Pete, to your point. Yes, I agree. I mean, he, he, he feels he's got strong principles, and that's why he's fighting, but, you know, he's right about the potential. The, I, I, don't, I don't think he'd get a year, but he's right about the potential. We put up a graphic on screen right as you were beginning to have this conversation with us, Pete, about some of the other people. For example, former chief of staff Mark Meadows, this is it, who has also been found in, uh, who has also been referred, rather, to the Department of Justice. And yet, the DOJ did not move, has not moved, at least as to this point, to indict, for example, Mark Meadows. Do you have any, perhaps, analysis, Pete, on why that is? Yeah, it was 171 days of, though, if you're, if you're keeping score at home, for how long it was since Congress cited him for contempt. I, I, I think a couple of things. Number one is because he's the former chief of staff of the president, it's been the longstanding view of the Justice Department that Congress can't compel those senior officials to testify any more than they could compel a president himself to because that would violate separation of powers. And secondly, and this is an unknown, it's possible maybe Meadows is cooperating with justice in some way we don't know about, and that's, that's delayed things. Um, Pete Williams, it is always great to have your analysis uh, and your insight here with us. Pete, thank you very much. Appreciate it. NBC News breaking the news today that survivors and parents of victims in the Uvalde and Buffalo mass shootings are set to testify in front of lawmakers next week in what is all but certain to be intense and emotional in a hearing on Capitol Hill. The panel is going to hear from the mother of Zaire Goodman, who was hurt at the Topps supermarket, and from Uvalde, Roy Guerrero, the town's only pediatrician. The parents of Lexi Rubio, who was killed at Robb Elementary School, and Mia Cerillo, the fourth grader. And this is really horrific to talk about and to hear, but she apparently will be testifying. Mia Cerillo, the fourth grader who covered herself in her classmates' blood and played dead just to try to stay alive. The public hearing comes at a really important time for lawmakers in both the House and the Senate as they're working on some kind of legislation to change the nation's gun laws. I want to bring in now Saha Kapoor. And Saha, let's start with this high-profile hearing next week. And there will be several of them. We just talked about January 6th. That's separate. The one we're talking about is on the House Oversight Committee related to gun safety. The chair of the committee says she hopes that this is going to turn anger into action, right? Right, Hallie. Uh, Chair uh, Carolyn Maloney says she hopes that this hearing will galvanize colleagues of hers on both sides of the aisle to act. She says it's all about saving lives. And of course, that uh, includes influencing public opinion. The goal here is to try to convey to people that this is not some sort of remote, distant, or far off thing. This is happening in towns and cities all over the United States where mass shootings have now become horrifically a regular feature of uh, American life. This could happen to someone who walks into a supermarket. It could happen to parents who send their kids to school expecting them to be safe and come home, and they may not. That is the goal here. They're trying to uh, it, uh, convey to people just how widespread this is, how frequently it's happening, and try to move public opinion in the direction of uh, enabling lawmakers to support some sort of uh, gun violence prevention legislation without fear of losing their seats. I think a lot of people's hearts are already breaking at thinking about hearing from that little girl, that fourth grader who was in the room trying to play dead to stay alive. There's that. There's the pediatrician from Ivaldi who will also testify. What insight is the committee hoping he'll bring? 
Well, it, he's a rare pediatrician in the town of Uvalde, population 16,000 roughly. He has uh, treated a number of these kids, including after that shooting where he told the Today Show he was called uh, into the hospital. He com compared it to a disaster movie. He saw kids running around uh, in blood, uh, covered in blood, screaming. There are surgeons treating them, nurses and doctors in every room. These are the kinds of stories that, again, the committee is trying to uh, want out there to try to convey to people how serious this is, how widespread it is, uh, in an attempt to, to sway public opinion in the direction of new gun laws, Hallie. You look about the push for new gun laws on the part of Democrats, and Senator Chris Murphy, who, of course, senator from Connecticut, represents the Sandy Hook area, has been leading the charge on the Democratic side on some of this. An interesting interview with The Washington Post where he kind of showed his hand at where these negotiations are headed, alluding to the fact that they don't have 60 votes, which is what they would need in the Senate with 10 Republicans on board for, for example, universal background checks. That's right. This is Chris Murphy leveling with the public about just how much Democrats have lowered the bar uh, for, you know, what they're willing to accept in terms of doing something uh, to try to stop mass shootings from happening in the future. Democrats don't have uh, the 50 votes they need to eliminate the filibuster in the Senate and pass, you know, gun violence prevention legislation themselves. So what has 60 votes? That requires at least 10 Republican senators, and that means universal background checks, even though it polls at 80 to 90 percent, is not going to happen. It doesn't have the, the support. So what can be done? That that includes some of the things that President Biden mentioned in his primetime address yesterday. It could include red flag laws, uh, mental health, uh, safe storage laws, where there's liability for individuals who don't store their weapons properly and uh, have them used in a, in a dangerous way to kill people. Those are the sorts of things that they're negotiating on. And Murphy has also said that Democrats, uh, their red line for Democrats is that anything they do has to have some meaningful impact. It's not just about checking the box and saying, okay, we're done here, Hallie. Just in the last couple of moments, we also heard from Vice President Kamala Harris, who says she has confidence in Senator Murphy, but she also is, um, she's optimistic, but in some ways tempering that optimism too. Sahil Kapoor, thank you for staying on top of that. I know we're going to talk again next week. To Yavalde now, where some newly unveiled search warrant documents show police have the shooter's iPhone and have done a forensic download of it. It comes as the first legal action has now been taken since that mass shooting last week. A special education staffer starting court proceedings against Daniel Defense. That's the company, the manufacturer of the AR-15 style rifle that the shooter used. Now, it's not a full-blown lawsuit, but it is meant to try to figure out whether or not Daniel can be sued for the way it promotes firearms. This is after a similar lawsuit in Newtown, Connecticut, against the manufacturer of the AR-15 used at Sandy Hook. The attorney who filed that suit, by the way, successfully is now working on this shooting at Robb Elementary. It comes against a horrific backdrop. These three beautiful little kids laid to rest today. Funeral services being held for Jacqueline Caceres and cousins Jace Carmelo, Luvanos, and Jaylee Seguero. Lives lost, lives stolen rather too soon. Guadvanegas is joining us now from Evalde. Well, let me start with these search warrants and what police say they found in the shooter's vehicle. Bring us up to speed. Uh, Hallie, well, there's a list of items that they found. It was an arsenal in or around that vehicle uh, that's inside that warrant. Uh, the police found another rifle uh, inside the vehicle. That was an M&P 15 rifle. They also found uh, nine cartridges, uh, all of these uh, magazines, that is, with uh, 30 cartridges each, with 30 rounds. These were under all of the seats spread throughout the vehicle. They found a duffel bag with 180 rounds. In addition to this, they also collected DNA samples, uh, DNA swabs, including two blood stains. these inside of that pickup, tr the pickup truck that he crashed outside of the school, Hallie. Let's talk about this sort of not lawsuit yet, but legal action that's being taken. Daniel Defense is the company. And you might remember, people might say, well, that name's familiar. Maybe you know it because you've seen the now viral Twitter post from back on May 16th, about a week before the shooting or so, with this picture of a kid, a child, holding one of the firearms. And the caption, if you can see it, reads, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So now this is the company facing questions about their marketing, right? That is correct. So what we have now officially, like you mentioned earlier, is this court filing. Now, this paperwork that was filed on Thursday is uh, to ask the company, uh, to ask officials from the company to sit down for a deposition and start answering questions. Essentially, they would have to answer questions. Uh, the document says uh, related to the lobbying, the sales, the profits, and also the marketing of these AR-15 style rifles like the one that was used uh, in the shooting, Hallie. 
I want to take a beat here, Gua, because one of the things that we've done as it relates to Evaldi is really try to center the lives here, the victims, the lives that were stolen, these little kids, right? And there's this joint funeral today for these cousins, Jace and Jayla. Um, just two of the funerals that we've seen as over the next couple of weeks, this community is going to be grieving so, so hard, really, for these kids. What are you seeing as you're on the ground there and the way that the community is coming together? Well, and you also have Jacqueline Casares. She had her services today. All of their services today happening at Sacred Heart, which is just down the street from the school. Uh, this church has held a lot of the services throughout the week. I mean, it's just every single yeah. day. Uh, we've been talking to people that come from out of town uh, because they feel like they need to bring some type of item to remember uh, the, the children that died. There's a lot of photos of the children when you walk right up to uh, these memorials now, one here outside the school, another one in the town square. And a lot of the people will walk up and silence and they will leave in tears because it's very difficult to see this. Uh, earlier we spoke to a school teacher who came from outside of Uvalde. She's a pre-K teacher who made her way here to attend Jacqueline Casares' uh, funeral because she is related to her. Before that, she stopped by and brought uh, stuffed animals that her students uh, were hugging last week and asked her to bring uh, specifically to this site. Uh, she came over and cried and talked about what it's like nowadays for a teacher like her. She said she's been teaching for yeah. 28 years, but with all of these mass shootings, it's just been very, very difficult. In fact, she talked about things like having to train her pre-K students mm. to react in case uh, there's some type of shooting and there's some trauma even when the students have to go through these trainings because they will bang on the door from what she told me they will try to scare them and try to make sure they react in the proper way these are these are the types of experiences that teachers have meanwhile she was on her way to attend uh, Jacqueline Casares uh, funeral Hallie it's just the awful reality for kids in schools these days Guad Venegas thank you for being there on the ground in Uvalde to Ukraine now where they are marking a difficult milestone 100 days since Russia invaded triggering Europe's worst war in decades. And it's not like Russia is close to stopping anytime soon. They're not. The Kremlin today says they're going to keep up their goals of what it, they've been calling this, quote, special military operation. Ukraine's not backing down either. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says they've already defended Ukraine this long and they are going to keep fighting. Right now, the focus for Russia is on the eastern part of the country. But these last hundred days have brought shelling, airstrikes, bombing to a whole lot of other places, too, like Bucha, for example, or like Mariupol where the mayor said 21,000 innocent people, civilians, were killed. You also have the millions of families with children who were caught in the middle of all this, lives now torn apart. Ali Aruzi is joining us now. And Ali, you've been covering this war for now months, right? It, which is a difficult sentence to imagine having to say when we started covering this war 100 days ago. What is the latest phase looking like there on the ground for Russia? Hey, Hallie. It's, um, it's a, as you mentioned, their focus is now on the Eastern Front, the Donbass region, Luhansk, uh, Donetsk. And it's a bloody, destructive and slow grind in that part of the region. They've poured most of their troops into there. They want to connect the dots on all of that area, the Donbass region to the Crimea, to Mariupol, which they took. That was one of their main objectives. And they're certainly not going to stop until they do that. I mean, from all the accounts we're hearing there, it's hell on the Eastern Front. The shelling is relentless. Morning, noon and night, the Russians are shelling towns on the Eastern Front. Uh, civilians are being torn apart there. They're losing their homes, livelihood, their families. As Zelensky even said that a hundred uh, Ukrainian troops are getting killed every day on that eastern front. So it's a real battle for them there. And there is no end in sight uh, for the Ukrainians there. The Russians are almost certainly not going to stop till they've occupied that entire region. And they've almost occupied uh, most, of that, most of that region. There's uh, Severodonetsk, which is the capital of the Luhansk area. They pretty much own all of that now. It's only going to be a matter of time before they take all of that. That'll give them control over the whole Luhansk area. And that's really grinding down on the Ukrainians. This is, they weren't expecting this to happen this quickly. The Russians have gained momentum. They've gained battlefield momentum. It's ebbed and flowed before. But right now, it's flowing in their flavor. And now we have to see that once they do take the Eastern Front, what's going to be their move after that? But for now, that 
that is a really terrifying battlefront for the Ukrainians as the Russians keep pushing forward. Well, you talk about what would the next battlefront be, and do you get the sense that Russia would try again for Kyiv? You know, right now you've got President Zelensky pointing out that some 50 embassies have restarted activities in Kyiv. They could close now the reopening, which is seen by some as a sign that Kyiv is somewhat stable at this point. That's right. It is stable right now. Life is pretty much back to normal in Kyiv. People are out on the streets. The shops are open. Uh, businesses are functioning again. But there is that niggling feeling that if Putin is successful on the Eastern Front, that if he can free up some troops from there, then the, the focus will then shift back to Kyiv. After all, it is the jewel in the crown for Putin. This would be a major victory for him. He didn't succeed the first time round. They've re-strategize. They have new battlefield commanders. They realize that they spread themselves too thin the first time round when they try to take Kyiv. So this time they may come here with new tactics. It would then uh, unlodge the Ukrainian leadership. It would probably force Zelensky to run, and that's just what the Russians want. But then again, uh, Putin may say that he has gained his objectives in this war by taking the Eastern Front, by taking Crimea, by taking Mariupol, and call that a victory. But given his maxim maximalistic objectives, that seems unlikely, Hallie. Ali Aruzi, live for us in Kiev. Ali, thank you. Turning to weather now with the entire southern half of Florida now under a tropical storm warning. Even though there's not actually a named tropical storm, either way, they are in for it. Check out this. Wind, rain, waves. But people are still out there snagging their selfies. This popular tourist spot out in Key West, considered the southernmost point of the United States. That doesn't, I don't know, like, does that look fun to you? Picture's going to get even worse as the wind and rain picks up, maybe becoming Tropical Storm Alex by the end of the night and bringing winds up to 60 miles an hour. But again, it's less the wind, it's more the rain that could be the real threat. Michelle Grossman is joining us now at the forecast. So the timing for this potential tropical storm, what is it and how much rain do you think it's going to dump? Uh, hi there, Hallie. And you said it perfectly. We do have the winds. We have 40 mile per hour winds. That's technically tropical storm force speed, but we don't have that close circulation. So we don't have that official name yet, although I do think we'll get that in a few hours. The big story with this is torrential rainfall. We're going to see up to 12 inches in some spots in southern Florida. That's a lot of rain. And I just received an alert at at least one killed and 400 evacuated from Havana, Cuba. So this is a big rainmaker, a sad story there. You could still see some rain in parts of western Cuba right now. Heavy rain falling in central and southern Florida. Where you see those darker colors, the yellows, the reds, the oranges, that's indicating where that heavy rainfall is falling. So this is the latest here. We're seeing winds at 40 miles per hour. We're seeing higher gusts from time to time. That will be the story as we go throughout the overnight hours. Moving northeast at 7 miles per hour. And we do have tropical storm warnings all up and down the central and southern coast here in Florida. We have it for the Bahamas as well, into the Keys. And it's going to be a rough night for many into the early part of Saturday. So as we go through the track and timing here, a tropical storm is expected later on today, maybe tonight, probably around 8 o'clock with that advisory. We'll, we'll uh, wait and see. But regardless, we still have those tropical storm force winds. We still have torrential downpours. And by tomorrow morning, we're going to see the biggest impact by the afternoon. Hallie, it's out of here by late Saturday night. Better conditions on Sunday, but we still have a ways to go. Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good to see you. Thank you. I know you have a busy weekend ahead of you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Speaking of Florida, by the way, coming up here on the show, the governor there, not playing ball. We'll talk about what he's vetoed in the state's budget that has a lot of people crying foul, thinking it's got remnants of that now infamous Disney dispute. We're going to explain that. Plus, the pomp and circumstance goes on without the queen, but not everyone got a royal welcome today. A lot of attention on Florida and Governor Ron DeSantis's controversial policies, making some serious moves toward banning transgender care for kids and vetoing money for a baseball facility for the Tampa Bay Rays. You might be thinking, well, wait a second, why? What's going on with the Rays? Some see that move as a response to the baseball team's support for gun reform. The governor said he believes it was simply the right thing to do. And yet, take a listen.
I don't support giving taxpayer dollars to professional sports stadiums, period. It's also inappropriate to subsidize political activism of a private corporation. So I think, you know, either way, it's not, not, not appropriate. The money was slashed from the new state budget the Republican governor approved just about 24 hours ago. And it comes not long after the Rays posted this tweet calling for change in the wake of those awful shootings in Buffalo, New York, and the horrific massacre in Uvalde, Texas, where the team's pitcher, by the way, is from. The budget cut comes a little more than a month after the governor revoked Disney's special tax status because of the company's stance on the state's parental rights law that many have dubbed the Don't Say Gay Bill. Mark Caputo joins us now to talk about this. And, Mark, you are our resident Florida man. You know this state well, right? What is going on with Governor DeSantis here? Is this, in fact, just a function of concerns over a new stadium? Is this a function of DeSantis, as he also said in that soundbite we just played, being concerned about the Tampa Bay race, taking a political stance he doesn't like? Well, I don't want to read the governor's mind, but I would say it's probably both. It's it's a safe guess. I mean, the reality is, is that whenever you survey whether taxpayers should subsidize millionaires playing for billionaires, people usually say no. And DeSantis knows that. But at the same time, I mean, he kind of gave the game away there and happened to mention their political activism. So it's difficult to divorce the two. Also, the reality is, is like DeSantis is a conservative governor or he campaigns and has governed as one. But the reality is like a hundred and nine billion dollar budget in the state of Florida is record setting big. It was bursting with so much money that, you know, if he runs in a competitive Republican primary and I don't know, say 2024 for president, hmm. the chance the chances that other Republicans are going to call him a big spender are pretty high. So what does someone like DeSantis need to do? He needs to veto a lot of money. And there were record vetoes in this record big budget of about $3.1 billion. And this was just one of the things to fall. There's a rather remarkable scene yesterday where the governor announced all of his vetoes. And he had the members of the legislature, the leaders of the legislature there, as he cut some of their hometown projects and the things that they were planning to go home and brag about. And he was just kind of like, hey, this is the way it is. So... The Tampa Bay Rays were no exception in feeling the sting of the veto pen. In Florida, they're allowed to do line item vetoes in the budget, mm -hmm. and governors like to exercise that and kind of flex their power. And DeSantis likes to flex his power, and you're certainly seeing that here. You've also done, Mark, some reporting on the governor's administration taking aim at blocking certain transition care for transgender kids. Tell us more about that piece of it. Right. There are a few states that do ban what's called gender-affirming care in the medical community that's prescribing hormones, puberty blockers, and in some very rare cases, surgery for kids who are transitioning, who are transgender. And what the governor is doing is rather than doing it through the legislative route, he is doing kind of a two-pronged uh, effort. On one effort, he's got the Department of Health saying, look, our guidance says this shouldn't be, and they're asking the Board of Medicine, which has physicians on it, to tell doctors, look, you can't do this sort of thing with kids anymore, with minors. On the other hand, or in the other department, he's got the Agency for Healthcare Administration, which oversees Medicaid spending, and they are going through the process of stopping Medicaid from financing puberty blockers, hormones, and uh, in some cases, surgery for Medicaid recipients in general. We don't have any numbers. We don't have any statistics about this. The number of people in society in general who identify as transgender, according to polls, is rather rare. But this is a major culture war issue. And as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, Ron DeSantis might be a 2024 presidential candidate. And this is one of the things that Republican governors, or better said, that Republican voters like to see lately. And DeSantis is delivering it in spades. Mark Caputo, thank you for that reporting. Appreciate it. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Germany say four people were killed and more than two dozen hurt after a train derailed near a popular ski resort. A local paper said a lot of students were on the train at the time. Prosecutors are trying to figure out what went wrong there. Number two, officials in Texas say an inmate who's been on the run for weeks died Thursday in a shootout with police. Hours before that, you had officers accusing the convicted murderer of killing a family of five. Police say he used that family's vehicle as a getaway car. Number three, George Burnett, the president of one of the biggest for-profit universities in the country, has stepped down from his job. We're talking about somebody who only took on that role at the University of Phoenix a few months ago. 
USA Today obtained documents showing the Education Department launched an inquiry into his time at a different college. Burnett could not be immediately reached for comment. Number four, a new study out of Ohio State University found brain scans can actually predict which way you lean politically. Scientists say they used artificial intelligence to analyze MRIs and were able to accurately predict whether the person was politically conservative or liberal. Researchers say this is important stuff because it shows the roots of political behavior could run a lot deeper than people previously thought. Number five, Pride Night tonight at Dodger Stadium today. And part of the celebration reportedly includes honoring the life of former outfielder Glenn Burke. MLB's first openly gay player. His oldest sister will be there along with 40 other family members and friends. To London now, where Queen Elizabeth was MIA, as expected, at St. Paul's Cathedral Service today for her Platinum Jubilee. Remember, we told you on this show 24 hours ago, she had been feeling apparently some discomfort, according to Buckingham Palace, so she didn't go to church. Service went on as planned. You see it here. Today's event meant to show the Queen's role as head of state and as head of the Church of England. So you had, obviously... Boris Johnson, charity workers, politicians all showing up. However, Boris Johnson did not get such a warm welcome. Listen to what happened. Yeah, those are boos. Johnson's still taking heat politically for those pandemic parties when the UK was under lockdown at the height of the COVID epidemic. Meghan and Harry were also there, their first official royal outing, if you will, since March of 2020. And it was kind of a mixed reaction for them. Some cheers, some boos. And when they got inside, they ended up sitting a little far from everybody else. Kelly Kobiaya is with us now live. And Kelly, first of all, shout out to you because I know you're doing this in the rain. So thank you for being with us, even on a wet, uh, a wet night there across the <laughs> pond. And let's start with the queen because, no, she wasn't at St. Paul's t today, right? She is not going to be attending another event at the Derby tomorrow, but she wasn't expected to. So how much more can we expect to see of her this weekend? Right, so no attendance at the Derby, which you're right, she wasn't really expected to be there. It's about a 40-minute uh, ride from her home at Windsor Castle to Epsom. And on top of that, she'd have to get around uh, there. And we know that she's been walking with a cane. She's been having what the palace calls episodic mobility issues. There may be a little bit more to that than the palace is actually telling us because they also said that that, that day, uh, yesterday, at the Buckingham Palace, Bal was, uh, was a little bit tough on her. Uh, it did wear her out a bit. So uh, the question is, will she be at the concert tomorrow night? Not at all likely. She was never really expected at the concert tomorrow night. Will she make an appearance at some point on Sunday? Now, that is a possibility, although Buckingham Palace isn't saying one way or another. But there's, there's talk of her possibly making one last appearance on the balcony at hmm. some point Sunday afternoon. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that, Hallie. A lot of tea leaf readers were looking at the like location of where people were sitting at the, the cathedral today. Prince Harry and Meghan, a little far from Prince Charles and the rest of the family in another row. What's it been like, Kelly, having them there after they left a couple years ago? It's been really interesting to watch the choreography and the planning surrounding all of this on the part of Buckingham Palace uh, and all of the organizers who are who are around the Queen. You know, they've kept a very low profile. They said that's what they were, or that those were the indications that that's what they were going to do. But of course, there was tons of speculation on this side that perhaps there would be a surprise visit somewhere that either Harry or Meghan or both would show up at one of their charities that they supported when they were working. Working royals. None of that has happened. There was even speculation that they might appear on the balcony uh, for that uh, f yesterday, on the big day yesterday, that the Queen would make some sort of exception for them and that they would appear alongside uh, other members of the of the royal family. That didn't happen. In fact, we just saw just snippets, just pictures of both Harry and Meghan uh, behind the glass, right. behind the window, watching over the parade at Horse Guards Parade, where that military parade takes place. And that was it. So it's, it's actually quite surprising uh, on some level that we haven't seen more of them, given uh, the history of all that has happened between them and the royal family. But also interesting, as you said, to see that seating plan today at the cathedral. They were on the opposite side of the aisle, one row back, clearly uh, reflecting their new position or not so new position as non-working royals sitting alongside Harry and William's cousins. Beatrice and Eugenie.
Kelly Kobiai, thank you so much. I'm glad you're there for us. Um, I know there's a lot to get to this weekend, too, with the rest of the celebrations. Appreciate it. Coming up next, here in the U.S., monkeypox. Cases doubling in the last week. And officials say they expect that number to keep going up. What you need to know right after the break. All right, let's do it. Let's talk about monkeypox because the CDC is. They're saying over the last week now, cases in the U.S. have doubled to 20. So it's only 20 cases across 11 states. We want to be clear. The CDC is still saying the overall health risk to people is still low and that most of the cases are coming from folks who just recently traveled abroad. But you've got public health officials now working hard to try to test more, to try to isolate patients, too. The World Health Organization seems a little less optimistic. They're saying they don't know yet whether it's too late to contain the virus or not. The CDC has identified at least 790 cases across 28 countries. The virus is most common in West Africa, has not been the cause of any reported deaths so far from this outbreak in the U.S. or Europe. Let's go now to CNBC's Meg Terrell, who's all over this one. Again, Meg, 20 cases, not a ton, right? That's not 2,000, that's not 20,000. But it's clear that the CDC is taking this seriously. Are they recommending that people do anything different right now? Not on a broad scale at all. I mean, mostly the focus is on awareness, making sure that folks know how this spreads and how to keep it from spreading further. Uh, and not just regular people, but also specifically clinicians, so that doctors and healthcare providers know what to look out for if they see this sort of telltale rash that they are testing for it. And then that can then trigger that cycle of testing, contact tracing, isolating, and providing early treatment or vaccines. All of the public health steps that we learned about in the beginning of COVID. What about this investigation of potential community transmission? What would that mean? Why is that important? Yes, yeah, so that essentially means that public health authorities have stopped being able to trace the origins of each case. And that essentially means we don't know where all of this is coming from and that it is potentially spreading undetected in the community to some extent. That's concerning because in order to contain something, you have to be able to uh, identify people, contact trace them, isolate cases, and provide the treatment or the vaccines or at least the isolation to stop the ongoing transmission. And so there is just a concern if you don't know where all these threads are coming from that there is more community spread happening than public health authorities can really keep their eyes on. Let me just de I don't, debunk maybe something pretty quickly here because the CDC points out that of the 17 patients who have provided demographic information, who have told more about themselves to the CDC, 16 of them self-identified as men who have sex with men. However, to our knowledge, this is correlation, not causation, right? Like, in other words, there's no more inherent risk for the LGBTQ plus community than for the community as a whole. Certainly not, except that we see it being spread in this network right now. And so there is outreach to make sure that folks in this community of men who have sex with men know that this is something that is spreading within this network. Uh, it's not because of the way that it spreads. It spreads by close contact. It just happens to be more prevalent in this group right now. Meg Terrell from CNBC. Always good to see you on a Friday afternoon. Meg, thank you very much. Just weeks after that horrific shooting at a Buffalo grocery store, New York State is trying to do something. We'll tell you what they're trying to do to strengthen gun laws after the murders of 10 people out shopping on a Saturday afternoon. And on this Gun Violence Awareness Day, our backstory, a look at a program that came out of the horror of Sandy Hook, hoping to make students and teachers feel safer. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, New York lawmakers have passed a bill that would raise the minimum age to buy and own a semi-automatic rifle. It is now, rifle rather, it is now 21. The governor there is expected to sign it into law. It comes just a couple weeks after an 18-year-old killed 10 people at a supermarket in Buffalo. From our Southeast Bureau, police in Texas say somebody broke into the Dallas Museum of Art Wednesday night and caused more than $5 million in damage. This man smashed things like a pot dating back to 450 B.C. and a Greek statue. Here he is. When asked why he did it, he apparently said he got mad at his girl. Like, can we just all say that's not a good reason to do that?
Right there. Anyways, he's in jail now on a charge of criminal mischief. From our West Coast Bureau, California regulators are given the green light for the state's first robo-taxi. From this company called Cruise, it's a self-driving vehicle startup. It's owned by GM, and it's now launching this whole driverless service, basically. It had already been offering free rides to people in San Francisco, but now Cruise can actually charge for them. Would you ride? Time now to get the backstory. Our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Today is Gun Violence Awareness Day, and we know across the country, schools are training students, and they have been, for what to do if a shooting does happen there. So we're taking it inside a school in Dallas to help stop it, hoping to help stop it from even getting to that point. This program is called Say Something, and students here are learning how to recognize the warning signs of somebody who might be at risk of hurting themselves or anybody else. They're also learning how to flag that to adults. This whole initiative came from Sandy Hook Promise, which is a group made up of some of the family members of people who were killed at Sandy Hook in 2012. Some three million students all across the country have now used this program. And for the principal at this Dallas school, she says it's made her feel safer. Having this training does make me sleep easier at night. No one should ever feel how those parents and families feel in Uvalde right now. Shaq Brewster reported onto this uh, and joins me now. And Shaq, you know, thank you for joining us for the backstory, which is really this segment, as you know, doing the behind the scenes look at what it takes for a story to come together. For this one, one thing that struck me about it was a lot of the what if questions that people ask, right? What if somebody had done something? What if something, somebody had, had heard something and did something about it? And that's what this program is intended to do. Right. What drew you to this story? Why did you decide that this was a story that you wanted to tell people about and shine a light on? Well, Holly, there's definitely the timing relevance and then the fact that we're in Texas right now where we are in Dallas, about six hours away from Uvalde, where I was earlier this weekend. But I mean, full disclosure, let's pull back the curtain a little bit. I wasn't supposed to be the one telling this story originally. Uh, this story was one that was slated for around December, around the Sandy Hook anniversary. But when we found out that they were having this training at the school uh, about a week after the Uvalde shooting, we bumped that up. And then our colleague Blaine Alexander was here the day before. Uh, that training taking place where she was getting ready to go to the school the next morning and then a gunman walked into a Tulsa uh, hospital so she was the closest one there she wow. was sent there and then I was put on this story so just to get a sense where you know part of the reason why you have this part of the reason why this group Sandy Hook Promise exists is because of gun violence the reporter originally assigned to this story got reassigned uh, because of gun violence so you get a sense it's not just about school shootings it's not just about shootings in general but it's a big problem that we have here and even in how we got to covering this story, you get a sense of that. Yeah, the through line that exists all the way through the coverage on this shack. How are you going into these conversations with kids yeah. right now on something like this? Because you talk to some of the students, too, and, like, you know, I've listen, I've talked to parents of, of kids myself in these last couple of weeks, obviously, and a, some of these parents are telling me, we don't want to talk to our kids yeah. about this, right? They're really young ones. You're talking to, I think it was high schoolers, right? It was yeah. one of the guys I saw that you had spoken with. Um, what are you doing to try to get them to open up to you about something that's just awful to think about, especially when you're in school? Yeah, the training is for middle and high schoolers. The folks I talked to yesterday were middle schoolers in sixth and seventh grade here. Uh, and, you know, one thing I noticed as I was watching the class, I sat in on the entire training that they went through, and the content of the training seemed a little weighty. They talked about ideas of suicide, violence, bullying. I thought it was a little bit much, but you saw the kids and they talked about the personal experiences that they had with them and how they were appreciated to have those tools available so that they can help other students. So after the training seminar, when I was talking with them about their experience, I really just brought up, you mentioned this in the class. Tell me a little bit yeah. about that. How are you feeling now having this training compared to uh, what you felt before? Did you feel safe with what we saw in Uvalde? That was something that came up in that training seminar. So I really just had those conversations using their own words, using what they were willing to share. And these yeah. were kids who were well-spoken and very open with me about personal experiences. One of the kids uh, said that he, uh, his, he lost his cousin to some school bullying. He didn't want to get too much into it, but he said yeah. one reason why he was really proud to do that ca class is because he didn't want his cousin's life to go in vain. If he felt like he was bringing purpose to however he lost his cousin, whether it was suicide or bullying, and that's just something that uh, really stuck out to me. Sometimes it's hard to get access to schools and to classroom shock, but I imagine in this instance, yeah. this school wanted to show what they're doing, right? Wanted to show the country the steps that they're taking in hopes that I imagine others might learn ways that could help protect their students. 
For sure. The access that we got here was extraordinary. We got to spend time in the classroom. We got to talk to any student that we wanted afterwards. The principal was available. Uh, we also got to talk to the instructor. So we had a lot of access. And it goes to the idea of the principal said, you heard as you were tossing to me, she said that this training makes her feel better at night. It helps her sleep better at night. She wants this training to be in every school. She wants every student to have this opportunity. We know that it's training that has touched at least 3.3 million students across the nation. So it's not just here in Dallas. It's right. not just here in Texas. But this is something that she wants more people to experience. And that was part of the access that they provided. Shaquille Brewster, Shaq, I'm so glad you pulled back the curtain for us and shared a little bit sort of inside this story and how it came together. Thank you so much for being there. We'll look for more of your reporting tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt at 630. Appreciate it. Still to come, two hours of happiness. That's what Ukraine's president is thanking the country's soccer team for. And those two hours could go a lot further this weekend. We'll talk about the team's World Cup dreams at a pivotal moment after the break. Some actual signs of excitement for Ukraine because this country torn apart by war is now just one win away from the World Cup. That's after Ukraine's men's team defeated Scotland Wednesday, 3-1. to one. The AP estimates there were like maybe 3,000 Ukraine fans there among the 51,000 in the crowd. Well, now they are just 90 minutes away from the world's biggest soccer tournament this fall in Qatar. The team in their way, it's Wales. And this is a real potential Cinderella story for Ukraine. They're again on the road for Sunday's match, and the historical context would be huge. It would put Ukraine in just their second World Cup ever since separating from the Soviet Union in 1992. The first happened in 2006, where they got out of the group stage, but eventually lost to the team that would be the eventual champion, and that's Italy. Nicholas Mendoza covers soccer for NBC Sports and joins us now. And Nick, what is so impressive about this Ukrainian team is that a lot of them play for clubs in their country, but obviously it's not like they have a league these last hundred days because of the story we covered at the top of the show, which is the war in Ukraine. It feels incredible they've made it to this point. Yeah, you know, the best that they could do at times was to play charity games overseas. And even that, you can imagine the emotional toll and weight that was on them, uh, considering they were basically considered ambassadors to keep the news in the headlines for people. You have Stadia over there, like FC Mariupol's ground. Um, their vice president said that he hoped these games would serve as a reminder to the world because their stadium may have been obliterated. They still have not even gotten in to see how bad it was. And war was never far from this team. Uh, the current manager of the team tried to enlist. He was turned away for being too old. One of its best <laughs> players, Tara Stepanenko, and his wife and kids were leaving Kiev to go to uh, another town they thought would be safer when they first witnessed a building kind of obliterated by a rocket. So when you consider that what they're carrying with them and obviously the weight of, of what they hope, as you said, could be such a great distraction for the people uh, in their country. It is absolutely amazing uh, that they performed as it's not that they won beating Scotland in Scotland is tough, but you could see Ukraine doing that. But to do it with what that must have been going through their heads yeah. in the uh, days, weeks and months leading up to it, it's nuts. How much is the world soccer fan dumb community, Nick, which like I candidly am not a part of. I like know what <laughs> soccer is. I don't watch soccer. How much are people like r rallying around the Ukrainian team right now? Because I'll tell you, even as a non soccer fan, this I'm captivated by this. I'm, I find it totally compelling. For sure. We saw it with um, in, the, in the Premier League when it was playing. West Ham uh, has a player, Andre Yarmolenko, from Ukraine. So does Man City and Oleksandr Zinchenko. And even at away games, you would see Ukrainian flags in the crowd. You would see people giving um, ovations. Players were often shown in tears before kickoff. Some players had to get, obviously, compassionate leave from their teams to step away from the team. So while Ukraine's semifinal win over Scotland, it, it, it had both upfront and also visceral reminders of this war. And you, you have to think um, of the enormous uh, respect and support the fans are getting. Part of that is because they understand this weight we talk about in the yeah. World Cup, of course. Listen, it's the one sport, right? The one sporting event, even for me before I was into soccer. You know what the World Cup is mm -hmm. and you pay a little bit of attention to it. I 100% agree. Real quick before I have to let you go. The, the sure. one thing is if they do make it to the World Cup, I think they end up in a group that includes England, that includes the U.S., right? W w would that mean mm -hmm. that in the World Cup we'd have to be deciding whether to root for the U.S. or Ukraine? Like, could they end up going head to head? 
Uh, well, they'll definitely play each other if this happens. And it's one of the reasons you were, it, it, it felt almost inhumane, but you were hoping, well, maybe Scotland or Wales, because how do you root against Ukraine, which is what Scotland and Wales are going through now? I view Ukraine is a bad matchup for the U.S. It'd be very difficult for both of the teams to go through, considering how good England is. But um, yeah, I think everyone in the U.S., at least, would, would trying to be root for both of these teams to come out together. Nicholas Mandela, thank you so much, Nick, for being on with us um, and for your soccer insights. I so appreciate it. So appreciate all you for watching this hour, too. We're going to have more for you here Monday, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.